Good morning, beloved. Welcome to the worship of the Lord on the Lord's Day. We are uh, glad that you are here uh, to celebrate this Palm Sunday with us. Of course, this is uh, the first Sunday of Holy Week. Uh, as we enter into Holy Week, we remember that uh, Christ came into the gates of Jerusalem, riding there on a donkey, showing us his humility and his servanthood. So much of a servant, in fact, that uh, as he entered into the gates of Jerusalem, his eyes were already to the cross of Calvary, where he would uh, bleed and die for the ransom of many. And so we come into the courts of the Lord to, to celebrate that gospel message of salvation that Jesus Christ came to die for sinners, just like you and me. And so we are thrilled that you are here to worship our Savior together. Of course, as we, uh, as we worship as New Testament believers, we know that the, the grave has already been defeated. And so we also look forward in anticipation uh, to celebrating Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, uh, next week. If you will look at uh, those announcements in your bulletins on page 7, you will notice our Holy Week schedule. Uh, starting with today, of course, both morning and evening worship. Uh, and then on Good Friday, this upcoming Friday at 6 p.m., we'll gather here back in the sanctuary for a Good Friday communion service. Uh, but as the session met this past Monday night, we uh, have decided to go ahead and uh, have a tradition of the church, it seems, and we'll have an Easter egg hunt uh, at 5 p.m. right before that Good Friday service. And so, um, since we're not having Wednesday night programs, that Easter egg hunt will not be on Wednesday night, but we will have it at 5 p.m. Uh, on Good Friday. And so please uh, make plans to join us and then stay for uh, the worship service. We hope that uh, you'll be pleased to be with us and we'll be encouraged by our time together, especially as we gather around the Lord's table. Uh, and then, of course, on Easter Sunday, how good it is that we get to meet yet again uh, all of our Easter uh, services and traditions were uh, canceled last year due to the pandemic, but we get to have sunrise service Easter morning at 7 a.m., uh, and then morning worship uh, at 11 a.m., of course, Sunday school there uh, at 9.45 a.m. Uh, of course, we're not having breakfast yet, uh, but, but we will have our sunrise service, and so we hope that you'll join us there on the lawn as uh, the weather permits. And then, of course, the following week, starting April 11th, will be our uh, start of Missions Week. You see we have a, a full docket of missionaries and church planners and uh, ministries that we support that's going to be with us. And so we hope that you'll uh, make special plans to be here. Also, during the session meeting, uh, an announcement that's not in your bulletin, during the session meeting this past uh, Monday night after... Uh, months uh, of, of talking and praying about this, we have decided that on April 14th, on April 14th, that's uh, the Wednesday night, the first Wednesday night of our missions week, uh, we are going to start back our children's programs and our fellowship dinners. Uh, and so we hope that you'll be uh, able to join us as you feel comfortable. Uh, again, we'll have our fellowship dinners there in the fellowship hall. We'll uh, work our best on trying to make things as uh, as safe as possible, and we'll also have some overflow tables in the Glenn Duncan McLaurin classroom right behind the fellowship hall, but we will be meeting for dinner on April the 14th and for uh, children's classes on April 14th as the, uh, as the adults meet for prayer meeting, and so we, uh, we hope that you'll be with us. We, of course, will be sending out some uh, letters explaining some protocols and recommendations for us as we continue to open up the church uh, and there will be even a brief video as we have been phasing back into the church uh, during this uh, past year but we are uh, so grateful for the Lord continuing to allow vaccinations to roll out continuing to allow numbers to uh, decrease within our community uh, and so we think it is uh, good for us to go ahead and continue rolling out our ministries as well. And so we hope that you'll be prayerfully anticipating uh, those times with us. Of course, there's some other announcements there that we hope you'll draw your attention to uh, throughout the coming day and week. But for now, let us prepare our hearts for the worship of the living God.
Our God calls us to worship by His Word, and you see that our call to worship comes from the ninth chapter of the prophet Zechariah on page 2 in your bulletin. If you'll please stand as you are able and let us enter into worship together. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, our King is coming. Righteousness and having salvation is He. Our Lord will appear over us and He will sound the trumpet, leading us forward. He will protect us and we shall be satisfied. The Lord will save us as the flock of His people. How great is His goodness and how great is His beauty. Our Savior has promised that we as His people will flourish. Let our hearts overflow with thanksgiving and worship. Let us pray together. Almighty God, indeed you are the fairest of all and you are the most beautiful. Ten thousands of ten thousands, who is mighty like our Lord? And Father, we come with thanksgiving on our lips for this mighty God has redeemed sinners. And as a people of God, made children of God, we come to worship you in spirit and in truth. Accept these songs that we sing Speak to us through the reading and preaching of your word. Let this day be a day that we can truly say that we have met with the Almighty God and He has spoken to us, He has encouraged us, and He has changed us. Would you do this for Christ's sake? And in His name we pray. Amen. If you'll open your bulletins there to page 4, we're going to sing that uh, great Palm Sunday hymn, All Glory, Laud, and Honor.
page two, uh, we will confess our sin together, uh, following the example that we see in the Old Testament of the people of God coming together and confessing their sins. Again, we'll do this together. You see this printed on page two under the corporate confession of sin. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought to have done. comes from Isaiah chapter 55, verses 6 and 7. We'll see that the penitent, for the penitent one, there is forgiveness with God for sinners. So Isaiah chapter 55, verses 6 and 7 reads, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon his name while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Well, thanks be to God. Let us turn now uh, to a New Testament reading. We've been going through Isaiah, uh, but this morning, as it is Palm Sunday, Pastor Matt will be going to the Old Testament to another prophet, to Zephaniah. So this morning, we'll be looking in the New Testament. You can see in your bulletin that our reading for this morning is in Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. So if you have a Bible... Uh, or if you feel comfortable using the Pew Bible, we'll be in Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. Uh, and this can be found in your Pew Bible, starting on page 1049. Um, again, Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. Well, this morning we'll see, as Pastor Matt has already said, we will see the king of the universe. Uh, the, man, the man who is both man and God. Christ Jesus coming into Jerusalem, the triumphal entry, and he is the king riding on a donkey coming to do uh, what as king he is to do, which is to conquer his foes, to carry out his mission by ultimately dying on the cross for sinners. So again, Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11 reads, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, it is good to give thanks to our Redeemer and King. Uh, as we know, the end of the story that he would come and, and appear to be 
destroyed and thwarted, but that is where he accomplished his mission on the cross. Um, So let us sing together, Lift High the Cross, which is number 263 in your hymnal, um, and please stand if you are able. be seated. Let us again turn our attention to uh, our God in prayer together. Father in heaven, indeed, uh, we come this Palm Sunday lifting up the gospel message of 
Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And Father, we uh, know the command of the Christian life to pick up our cross and follow after our, our Lord and Savior, knowing uh, that this uh, life is a journey through a strange land, a sinful world, a world uh, that is not our own. And it's not our home. We are just simply passing through, and, and yet your promise is sure that by your word and by your spirit, you will guide and direct us uh, along the paths of righteousness. Father, we do, uh, with much thanksgiving uh, in our hearts and on our lips, uh, come knowing and confessing and proclaiming that, that this gospel message of, of this holy week, Jesus uh, being obedient all the way to the cross of Calvary, dying for uh, the ransom of many, being resurrected uh, so that we may have life forever. That gospel message has indeed uh, softened our hearts, has indeed transformed us, has indeed sent revival to our individual selves. And yet, O oh Lord, your promise is sure that that gospel message that, that drew us unto thee uh, is the same gospel message that saves sinners today. And so, Father, as we uh, do pray for the church and the world this morning, we, we pray that uh, revival would be sent to our land, that we as a church may uh, have a, a true spiritual awakening growing uh, in, in number, growing uh, in strength, growing in our spiritual walk uh, of faith. Father, we uh, do proclaim that that gospel message that is able to save sinners uh, is the one that, that gives us a, a word to speak. Uh, and so, Father, we pray that we would uh, take the gospel message that has changed us and we would proclaim uh, that we would be the mouthpieces of the Lord and we would say this gospel message can give hope to the hopeless uh, and change uh, and transform and save uh, even the vilest sinner. Father, we do pray uh, through the pulpit surround uh, our nation that we would experience uh, real revival across our land. Uh, we pray that you would draw men, women, and children unto yourself, that you would, uh, through our missionaries and church planners, go about the world uh, and grow your kingdom. Uh, Father, the promise is sure that your kingdom is always growing, it's always increasing, it's always bearing fruit. And Father, we pray that we would be just a small part of that growth, uh, that we would see fruits uh, being born even here within our church, that we would hear reports of fruit being born within uh, our missionary updates and within our church planners' uh, churches, Father. We do pray that you would uh, pour out your Spirit upon us afresh so that we may uh, bask in your presence and so that we may uh, see your hand moving. Uh, even in our midst. We, we do thank you, Father, for uh, your word uh, that is sharper than any two-edged sword that reveals to us who you are, how wonderful and beautiful and gracious uh, and merciful you are, and how we are in need of that grace and mercy and steadfast love that only you can give. And so, and so Father, as we come to this time in your word, in Zephaniah 3, we pray that it would uh, indeed uh, transform us, that it would indeed sanctify us, that it would uh, indeed encourage us uh, for the days ahead. May we see the beauty of King Jesus uh, just as we uh, read in Matthew that, that we would sing praises to King Jesus, that we would not fear for King Jesus is here uh, leading us. Uh, to his forever kingdom. Father, give us ears to hear your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you will, go ahead and take out your copies of God's word or those pew Bibles there before you. Uh, we are looking at Zephaniah chapter 3 verses 9 through 20. Admittedly, we will be focusing in on verses uh, 14 through 17, but for the sake of context, I want to go ahead and read Verses 9 through 20. The minor prophet Zephaniah is one that uh, Matthew begins to pull from as he begins to tell the story of the triumphant entry of Christ on that first Palm Sunday. And on that Palm Sunday, as Jerusalem 
uh, gathered there for the Passover, as they held those palm branches in their hands, they saw a king, the king of all creation, as Don said, enter into the city there on the back of a donkey. Admittedly, that's not exactly the way that we would think a mighty and powerful king would enter into the city, especially uh, knowing that victory was sure to come. And yet, uh, the gospel message proclaims something that very moment, as promised way back in Zechariah and Zephaniah, that this Christ humbled himself all the way to the point of the cross. And so what you need to remember, especially on Palm Sunday, especially as we see this this picture of King Jesus in Zephaniah chapter 3, that as Jesus entered into the city, his eyes were already set on the cross of Calvary. You know, throughout the Gospels, we see these transitional moments happening as Jesus takes his eyes off of the Galilean region, and he, and he casts his eyes to Jerusalem, and he heads there knowing what awaits him knowing that he will be falsely accused, knowing that he would be uh, trod in a mockery of a court trial, knowing that he would be murdered at the hands of his own people there on a Roman cross, but also knowing uh, that victory was sure for him. And you know what's so awesome about the minor prophets is uh, so often we are confused by their words and we are confused by the imagery that these minor prophets proclaimed to us in the Old Testament, and yet the gospel message is what's clear. In every minor prophet, you have a proclamation of judgment, God's wrath against sin. In every minor prophet, you have a call to repentance. And in every minor prophet you have, if you will come to Christ in repentance and faith, He will indeed be mighty to save. And that's exactly what we see here in our text in Zephaniah 3, starting in verse 9. This this proclamation, this call from the minor prophet to say, here is the salvation of the Lord. He is the one that is mighty to save. He is King Jesus, the promised Messiah, and also Yahweh, the God of the covenant. And He is here to forgive you of your sins. And so, as Zephaniah chapter 3 paints this picture of King Jesus, the very one that entered into the gates of Jerusalem, let us hear this prophecy about him, starting again in verse 9. For at that time I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech, that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshipers, the daughters of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. On that day you shall not be put to shame because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For then I will remove from your midst your proudly exultant ones, and you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. But I will leave in your midst a people, humble and lowly. They shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord. Those who are left in Israel, they shall do no injustice and speak no lies, nor shall there be found in their mouths a deceitful tongue, for they shall graze and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. For the Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion, let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst. He is a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time I will deal with all of your oppressors and I will save the lame and gather the outcast and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time I will bring you in, at the time when I gather you together, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of all the earth. 
when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God remains forever and ever. You've heard that saying, and maybe you've even used that saying, that absence makes the heart grow fonder. And you always say this, or you always think this, when you have been separated from someone or something that you love, and you realize in the absence of those things how much you really love them. You know, we're a year into the COVID pandemic, and quite frankly, it's been used in many of pulpits as many illustrations, but just think about the Easter schedule. Last year, this time, we were uh, doing virtual services. There was really no one here in the sanctuary but a handful of us, and we had to do uh, Palm Sunday and and Good Friday and, and Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, apart from one another. And maybe if you're like me, it's made your heart even fonder and more uh, anticipation towards uh, even this next Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, so that we can be together again. Maybe during the COVID pandemic, it was, you know, family traditions that was broken. Uh, maybe you missed, I hope that you did, the church fellowship uh, that has been amiss in many lives. And we felt the weight of these things being, being taken away from us. And we have said over and over again, absence makes the heart grow fonder. It's those things that we hold dear to us. It's those things that we, we love and that we cherish. It's those people uh, that we adore and we miss. You know, one of the things that, that was so often missed as I talk to people here and there through the pandemic is that I simply miss going to restaurants and laughing with my friends. I miss gathering around on Wednesday nights for fellowship meals at the church. I've, I've missed these things. There's people that we long to be with. There's things and places that we long to do and long to be. And, and absence makes the heart grow fonder. Well, you know, when we talk about missing something, and when we talk about how Missing something is an indication of how much you love it. I hope that I'm not too cliche when I ask, when is the last time that you have said, I've missed spending time with Jesus? When is the last time that you said, you know, I, I really long to be hearing from my Lord during my morning devotions and reading His Word? When is the last time on a hard Tuesday you said, I cannot wait to get into the house of the Lord with the people of the Lord to be in the very presence of the Lord? Well, admittedly, it's not as often as we should because, quite frankly, beloved, in this world that is broken by sin, the temptations arise and our faith becomes somewhat of a chore, our faith becomes something that is often lackluster. You might say, and I've said this even in my own life, that I'm in somewhat of a, a spiritual rut. And it's in those moments that we can go one of two ways. Either I can scold you and put you to shame, like many fathers do, and say, well, the Word of God tells you that you need to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and, my, and with all your strength, and you just simply need to do better. Or, we can do what Solomon does for his son in Proverbs and says, here is Christ and look how beautiful he is. Look how majestic he is. Look how magnificent he is. And don't you want to love him even more? Well, it's in a real way that I think that through the inspiration of the Lord, Zephaniah is doing that exact thing because here we are in, 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 in the season of life for the Israelites that they have, you know, been dispersed. They have been cast away uh, into the regions of Babylonia. They have been under the tyranny of an evil one, and, and do you see what the Lord promises? That as they are dispersed, I will gather them back together. 
And as they are gathered back together, here is who you will worship. It is the Lord, the promised Messiah, Yahweh himself, that is to be worshipped. And so as we hear this calling to shout aloud, as we hear this calling to sing, as we hear this calling to fear no more because the Lord is in our midst, we have this calling to understand the beauty of this King Jesus who rode into the gates of Jerusalem on a donkey so that he might save sinners. You know, that is the first point that that Zephaniah begins to draw out for us. It's there in verses 15 and in verse 17. And our first main point is Jesus is the king who is mighty to save. You know, as Zephaniah begins to hold out Christ to us, begins to tell us about this promised Messiah that will that will save us from our sins, who will take away our judgments. As, as a profound painter, he paints this picture uh, of King Jesus, and he tells us first that he is mighty to save. Again, in verses 15 and 17. You know, we have to understand something about the prophet Zephaniah and his ministry, because he, he is really the counterpart to, to King Josiah. And you might know a little bit about King Josiah there and. 1 Kings 22 and 23, you know that King Josiah is a good king. Actually, the last good king of all of Judah. After Josiah dies, a new king will be uh, raised up. And under that king's leadership, they will be conquered by the Assyrians. Uh, Zephaniah is the prophet to King Josiah's reformation, you remember. If you know anything about King Josiah during his reign in 621 B.C., Uh, you know that he discovers the book of the law and it leads to a profound reformation there in the in the region of Judah in the kingdom of Judah well Zephaniah is the prophet that proclaims all of these magnificent reforms uh, that's going to take place there in the kingdom of Judah and yet the reforms don't last Uh, it's, it's a pattern of the people of Israel Uh, It's a pattern of God's chosen people. They believe, and you see this really profoundly in the book of Judges. They believe. uh, They're called to repent. They repent. God gives them blessings. God gives them good leadership. And then uh, in a generation, they fall again into their sins and idolatry. Well, here it is that, that this pattern is taking place within the king Josiah's reign they have reform there's repentance there's joy in their salvation and yet not even a generation later uh, they are they are engulfed in their sin yet again and and when Zephaniah begins to proclaim that 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 the Lord is mighty to save can you imagine how that strikes the ears of his hearers Because here it is that they will soon find out as the Assyrians come and they conquer uh, yet again the people of God, they, they hear Zephaniah's words. That human kings, that that human leadership can only get you so far. What we need in this life is King Jesus. If we are to experience real lasting reformation, if we are to experience real lasting restoration and redemption, if we are to experience a full salvation, we need one who will take our judgments away. Earthly kings and kingdoms, they'll come and they'll go. They'll pass away. They'll blow like a leaf in the wind being blown to and fro, and yet we need one who will reign forever and ever. You remember the promise to to King David, right? The, The same promise that said, David, there will always be a king from your lineage on my throne. And yet, after King Josiah, it will seem like the lineage of David coming comes to a screeching halt. What are we to do with this promise, Lord? What are we to do now that we have been cast away? And the Lord says, I will bring all my dispersed ones back unto me and sitting on the throne, reigning over them, will not be an earthly king. It will actually be King Jesus. He is the mighty one who will save. You can see it 
there for you in verse 15. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You know, no matter how complicated uh, and how nuanced you can make minor prophets in the Old Testament, there is no room for guessing here. When Zephaniah talks about who is this king, you notice what he says, right? The king of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. Now, pay very careful attention to the way that our English translation is writing because you notice there when it says the Lord, and I like to draw this out every time we see it within the Old Testament, it's talking about God's covenant name. When you see Lord in all capital letters in your English translation, you put in place there the Hebrew name Yahweh. And that draws us all the way back to Exodus 3, where where Moses is called by God himself through the burning bush to go there into Egypt to proclaim the deliverance of his people, to tell Pharaoh uh, that, that God's people will no longer be under his tyranny, Uh, but they will be led out of his kingdom and that they will indeed receive a land of promise. And you remember, Moses says, listen, I'm a weak man. I have a stumbling tongue. Why will people believe me? Why will they listen? And he says, tell them that Yahweh sent you. Tell them that the Lord sent you. And immediately it draws you into the covenant promises of the Lord. This is the Lord who made the promise to David that made the promise to Moses, that made the promise to Noah, that made the promise to Abraham, that I will be a God to my people, and they will be my people forever and ever. He says, watch what I, Yahweh, am doing. I am putting my Messiah, the chosen one, on the throne. He will be the king. And it's it's all this building upon each other as the prophets write, because you can almost hear even as... As Zephaniah speaks on behalf of the Lord, these these parallels with the prophet Isaiah that comes before. Because here he is, the Lord your God, in your midst, the mighty King of Israel. And because he reigns, you will never again fear evil, nor will you face the judgment that your sins deserve. Here it is, we have King Jesus And He is the one who is mighty to save. Isn't that exactly what the triumphant entry into Jerusalem takes us to? Isn't that exactly the the message that, that Matthew chapter 21 is proclaiming? That as Jesus enters into the city of Jerusalem, He does not come as a subordinate to King to the King, the Lord, to Yahweh Himself. No, here is Yahweh the King of all creation, the King of the universe who has humbled Himself and taken upon flesh so that He might redeem His people. You see, that is why we sing hymns like Lift High the Cross because God Himself has become a sacrifice for many. As New Testament believers, we can understand the the grace and the mercy and the steadfast love that Zephaniah is talking about here Because we know that Jesus is the very Son of God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who went to the cross humbly and obediently so that He might fulfill God's promise of salvation that we see even here in verse 15. Why did Christ come? Why did Yahweh take on flesh, dwell among us, full of grace and truth? And why did He go to the cross of Calvary and die? so that we may sing aloud, so that we may rejoice, so that we may exult because our judgments have been taken away, for they have been put upon King Jesus. King Jesus is the mighty one who will save. But also, don't you see our second point here in verse 17? Jesus is the king whose love is unmatched. Jesus is the king whose love is unmatched. Because as as we look at verse 17, and I hope you're looking at it with me, it's talking about how he's in our midst, that he's the mighty one who will save, and that he will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you 
with loud singing. Do you see how the tables have turned? In the first verse, the calling is for us to sing, for us to rejoice, for us to exult. And now, Zephaniah is saying it's the Lord, Yahweh Himself, who is taking great pleasure in saving His people. You know the picture here, don't you? That when you're, when you're happy, when you're glad, when you're in a good mood, uh, people look at you at the red lights like you've lost your mind because you're blaring, uh, singing uh, to yourself in the car. Maybe that's not you, maybe it's just me, and I get all the weird looks uh, while I'm singing in the car. Uh, but, 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 but out of a heart of, out of, a heart of joy... Song comes. And that's exactly what Zephaniah is saying. There is joy in the heart of the Lord as He saves His people. And that is a, that is a proclamation that, is, that, that quite frankly should be mind-blowing because who are we? Who are we to deserve this joy and this mercy and this steadfast love of the Lord? Who are we for God Himself to... Rejoice in us. See, if, if this was us forgiving sins, we would be the ones that would put those who have done us wrong to shame. And, and yet, Zephaniah says there's no shame to be given. Actually, there's just joy in the heart of the Lord as He forgives His people. O. Palmer Robertson calls Zephaniah 3.17, the John 3.16 of the Old Testament. Because he, he pulls out this idea of this personal love that the, that the Lord, Yahweh, has for His people. Look at it. He rejoices. He's glad. He calms you with His love. He exults over you with loud singing. You see, not only is... Jesus the King who is mighty to save, but He is the one whose love is unmatched. His love is unmatched. Think about how this would have landed with the early readers of Zephaniah. It lands the same way with us. That as Zephaniah proclaims these truths of the Gospel, an unworthy people, a broken people, a sin-filled people, an unfaithful people are hearing this, and yet he brought, brings in the covenant promises of the Lord. He's, he, he, he points you to hope and promise and to reconciliation, and he says, you are an undeserving people, and yet the bridegroom has made you the bride. And he rejoices over you, and he exults in you, as a husband does his wife on the wedding day. And then you see it in verse 17. He will quiet you by His love. What does that mean? Well, we need to understand a little bit of the original language here. I, I don't think any of us are Hebrew scholars, but it doesn't take much grammatical work to, to see that this language is quite unique to the minor prophets because usually the minor prophets, when they're using the word for God's love, they use this Hebrew word hesed, and yet it's ahava here. And ahava is used very specifically in the story in Genesis 29 of Jacob and Rachel. You probably know that story well. Jacob sees Rachel, and in, in that very moment, love at first sight, remember? He has, this, he has this ahava love for Rachel, and so he commits himself to, to seven hard years of labor to, to take her hand in marriage. And right there in verse 20 of Genesis 29, it says, So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. He worked for her for seven years, and yet it seemed like just a few days because of his love for her. Do you understand what the prophet Zephaniah is trying to proclaim here? He, he's trying to tell you that the love, the Ahava love of King Jesus puts him to work. He, he loves his bride so much, he's willing to put in the work to get her hand in marriage. And beloved, it's not seven years of hard labor on a farm. No, it's death. It's suffering. It, 
It's taking on the full wrath of hell itself as we proclaim in the Apostles' Creed. It's Him being buried and resurrected so that He might, out of a passionate love, out of an unmatched love for His people, redeem them from their sins, to take away His judgments against Him. Here it is that Jesus, like Isaiah 53, 7 says, He, like a sheep before its shears, is silent and He opens not His mouth. And He's led to the cross of Calvary so that He might die in our place and so that He might be resurrected to give us everlasting victory and life. Believer in Jesus, that is a love that is unmatched. You think about all the love that we might experience here on this side of glory. The the love of a happy marriage. The love that that a father and mother has for their children. A love that we have for one another. And, And yet, the love that Jesus has, King Jesus has for His people is unmatched. I love what the commentary commentator Matthew Henry says. He says, God doesn't just love you, He loves to love you. Isn't that a powerful picture? That God doesn't just love you, He he loves to love you with with a love that is indeed unmatched. Do you think about the way that Paul writes about in Romans chapter 5? But God showed His love for us, and while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If you want to see the the unparalleled, the unmatched love of King Jesus, just simply look to His his Passion Week. As He enters into the gates of Jerusalem, His eyes are to the cross of Calvary so that He may lay down His life as the perfect and eternal sacrifice so that His people might be redeemed. And then there's a third and final point very quickly. It's there for us in verses 14 and verse 16 because Jesus is the king who is mighty to save, that Jesus is the king whose love is unmatched, and yet Jesus is the king whose kingdom is here and is still to come, because here we are in the already and not yet of the Christian life. We have the love that Jesus has for his people, we have the salvation that Jesus bestows upon his people, and yet the scriptures promise us that that this fullness of salvation is yet to come. And so Zephaniah actually tells us how to sing, how to live in the already and not yet. How are we to live as a people of God who is awaiting the the full consummation of, of the king's love for his people? Well, he tells us in verse 14, we sing aloud and we shout, we rejoice and exult with all our heart. You see, if we go back to the opening illustration and where we admit that oftentimes absence doesn't make our heart grow fonder of King Jesus, he tells us, look to the one who loves you with a love that is unmatched. Look to the one who who saves you from your sins and all those judgments and understand that your command is to simply praise him for it. The first thing that we need to do in this Christian life as we are awaiting the full consummation of the kingdom of Christ that is to come, we need to be persuaded each and every day of the depths of His love for us. We need to be persuaded that the King of all creation would take the place of a rebel. We need to be persuaded that in the midst of this battlefield that is the Christian life, we are a people who has the Lord singing loudly over us. We need to be persuaded, we need to be convinced that even in our stumblings with temptation, that Christ does not meet us with shame, but He meets us with unparalleled, unmatched love. And then in verse 16, He tells us, he tells us the second thing that we are to do in the Christian life as we bask in the presence and the love of our King. He tells us that we are not to fear And we are not to let our hands grow weak. Now what does that mean? It means that we are not to neglect the Christian duty and the Christian service that we are called to do. And if you are to ask what is the service of God's people 
as subjects to King Jesus living uh, in his kingdom of love and grace and mercy. How are we to serve him? Well, we are to serve him by serving others just as he came to serve. You know, it's that beautiful picture that we will even talk, you know, talk about uh, this week during Holy Week that as Jesus uh, begins to wash the disciples' feet there in the upper room uh, on Maundy Thursday, that he, uh, that he tells the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve. And then he calls his disciples uh, to a life of service. And he says, go and serve just as I have served. Go and love just as I have loved. And so if we are to see the unmatched salvation, the unmatched love of the Lord, we are called to go spread that sacrificial love with one another. And if we are to do those two things, if we are to enjoy the love that the Lord has for us, if we are to go and lay down our life in sacrificial love with, for one another and with one another, then we can be those who are called to rejoice and to find our full salvation in the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Let us pray together. Father in heaven, we do thank you for the opportunity to come and see this beautiful picture of King Jesus. And as he enters into the gates of Jerusalem on this Palm Sunday, we pray that we would always be convinced that his eyes were ever to the cross at Calvary. That as the people sang, Hosanna, blessed be the name of the Lord, as they were singing, save us, his eyes were to the cross of Calvary where he would save his people from their sins, that he would take away their judgments. And so, Father, let us always be convinced that because of Christ and because we belong to him, that he is our king and we his people, that our salvation is secure in his life, death, and resurrection. And so, Father, just as he has humbly served us through his Passion Week, we pray that we would go out into a world and be living Ebenezer's of that service with one another and to one another. For Christ's sake, amen. All right, it is good for us to sing. And so if you'll take out your bulletins, we're going to sing uh, that hymn in Christ alone. It's on page 6 uh, in your bulletin. Please stand as you are able.
And let me remind you of our uh, evening worship service tonight at 6 p.m. And let me draw your attention uh, to our response, which is uh, the doxology. And now, people of God, uh, receive the blessing of God. To Him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by His blood and made us a kingdom, priests to His God and Father, to Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen.